everyone. Uh, let's get settled and get into this. So I would first of all like to apologize because I'm hopped up on pain meds. So if I sound a little slow, um, and if I'm slurring some words, it's because I've taken the good stuff for pain. So um, what I really like to do at the beginning of every, has the timer started? Because I see it's not moving uh, over here. I mean, I can, oh, okay. There you go. Okay. So, um, Nnedi, what I like to do is I always like to do um, just an icebreaker, which is if you and I got into a lift or an elevator and you had to tell me about broken places and outer spaces, and so I have to get my timer out, and I'm going to say I'm just in the lift for a minute, and I'm actually going to, okay, timer, I'm going to put a minute on this. <laughs> if you had to tell me about broken places and outer spaces, what would you say? And I'm going to start your time now. Um, <laughs> it would be that it's, it's a story about how I became a writer. And it's, um, it's a lot. It's a lot. That's what I would say. Wow. <laughs> nobody has ever done. I mean, we're at 47 <laughs> seconds left. All the time I've done this, nobody has ever been able to actually do. Wow. OK, I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm never going to do that again. You've broken me. I get to the <laughs> point. I get to the point. <laughs> So actually, let's get to the point. Um, a lot of the times, people say what kind of writers we are. You know, I wrote one essay about Afrofuturism not being for Africans in Africa, and suddenly I'm a person who has opinions about Afrofuturism when it was just right. one thing. I wrote a collection of short stories that were uh, speculative fiction, and suddenly I'm obsessed. I'm, I'm the writer who does speculative fiction. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you, what kind of writer you are. Not what people say you are, what kind of writer are you? I don't know. I don't <laughs> think about stuff like that. I just do it. I just do it. I don't think about um, like uh, what it is that I do. I don't yeah. like, I, I'm not really, and I, it's, it's funny because I'm always talking about African futurism and how it's different from Afrofuturism and all yeah. of that, but I'm not one for labels. I don't like labels. I find them confining, and I like to write what I want to write when I want to write it. I, and sometimes I, I don't know what's, what's going to come. Like, I don't know what, what's going to come. I don't outline. I, I'm, I'm the kind of writer who just sits down and just starts. So I don't know. I don't, I don't know what kind of writer I am. I'm, I'm, yeah. I always find it surprising that when I when I encounter your your work, you know, and I'm like, okay, I, you know, I read the Akasa series, I did the Binti series, uh, La Guardia, and all of your work. Every time I approach it, and I'm like, wow, this is different. And so when I was handed, here it is, please get it, uh, Broken Places, Outer Spaces, and of course, the suggestion was the talk was going to be around you pivoting from your style. And I was like, this is actually not pivoting at all. At its core, it's still a very Nnedi Okorafor book. And there, there's a bit in here, I hate spoilers, but I'm going to mention some things. There's a bit in here about um, when you're in hospital recovering from your operation and you see these amazing grasshoppers. Yes. And there was a moment where I was like, was it the morphine or was it your imagination? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and so, I mean, this is mm -hmm. what's so wonderful about this, is you, you never quite know. And even at the end of this, I was like, well, they changed her meds to codeine, and you were still seeing things. And from, from your perspective, was that imagination, or was it both codeine, morphine, and imagination? It's a good question. Because, okay, so... I don't know how, ma how many of you know the story of um, Broken Places in Outer Spaces, which is the, the way that I became a writer. And it's... it's, it's a lot to explain. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's a lot to explain. It involves um, having this spinal surgery that left me paralyzed from the waist down, and it was not. Um, I was an athlete. I was like a mega athlete, and then I ended up. Um, I had the surgery for scoliosis that was um, supposed to be routine, and there was this. Just a, I had a weird response to it, and there's like, there, um, there's one percent of the population that has this response, which is paralysis, where literally you don't know, they don't, they didn't know if I would ever walk again, and they didn't know why. So I went from mega athlete to that in one day, where it was a complete surprise, and that was when I started writing. It was when I was in the hospital bed that I started writing, and so. Um, when, when this happened, it's, it's a very painful surgery, and so they had me on morphine, 
and you know, and that's very normal. But for me, when they gave me this morphine, I had these massive hallucinations, and I talk about that in the book. Um, I was seeing these uh, pink and green grasshoppers jumping around the room, and I love grasshoppers, so there's that. And I was seeing a crow that was trying to come through the window, just kept hitting the window. There was a merman in the ground that was swimming through the floor. Um, so I'm, seeing, I'm having these massive hallucinations, and I remember my family being in the room while this was happening, and I was just like looking around. And, and I don't drink, <laughs> I don't do any of that, I don't do anything, and so, so this is really crazy. So they eventually switched me to codeine, which is, which is um, still, you know, it's still a powerful medication, but it's supposed to be not as bad, and I still was having these massive hallucinations. So the question is, was it my mind that was naturally doing this, or was it, was it the, the drugs that they were giving me? And I think that it was probably a little bit of both. I think that like I'm susceptible to that. Like I can't, you know, if I'm in the room with marijuana, for example, and if I inhale that, I hallucinate. It causes me to hallucinate. Like I can, I've seen time stop. I've seen a lot of things. So, so yeah, I think, um, has to do with my mind. I've always been a very imaginative kid, even before I was a writer. I started writing when I was 20, and um, even before that, I was very imaginative. I would see communities of, like, I'd see pigeons, and those would be communities of people to me. Just, that's just one example. Well, you see, I really like that, because when I, when I was reading this, I, I came to understand you more as a writer and the stories that you tell, because I know the theme of IK this year is homecoming, but that's what I, that's what I got from this. You're, you're coming home to yourself and, mm. and actually allowing your, your imagination to run wild and owning it. And mm. there, there's a sense here where you, you were very passionate about science and you were, you were pre-made. And after, after the, the operation, you kind of were mad at science. And then you went and did the science and the imagination. So were you really mad at science? Oh, yeah. I, was, I wasn't just mad at science. I had lost confidence in it. Yeah. I'm like, we don't know what we're doing. You know, like this thing, I, this thing happens to me and nobody knew why. You know, I had my, I saw my, um, the surgeon who performed the surgery on me, I had been, I had been named uh, All-State Athlete of the Year in the state of Illinois that year. And I saw him come into my hospital room with puffy eyes. He'd been crying. Yeah. Because he was like, oh my God, I have just destroyed the, the top athlete in the entire state. You know, and so I like, and this was my surgeon who, who, who was like that. So for me, I was just, I, I had lost complete confidence in, in medicine. Cause I'm like, okay, there's th maybe we get some things right, but there are things we just, we don't understand as much of this as we think we do. And mm. I, it took me a long time. I, I'm not even quite back yet. I okay. still say that, I still say that. Yeah. And how was it for you to then go, okay, you know what, science, take a back seat because I'm, because your, your friend encouraged you to say, you know, why don't you actually like take a creative writing yeah. class or, because I know you, you kind of were like, ugh, to the idea of teaching, um, I'm writing. And I, I almost wonder if your friend had not mm -hmm. um, encouraged you to do creative writing, do you think you still have wound up in that place? Because I feel like it was almost fate. Yeah. It's, um, that's why I, it's hard for me to ask those questions, like would I be a writer if this didn't happen to me? Like that question too. Um, okay, so this friend, like I was writing these little stories, I didn't know what they were. I was coming from a pre-med background, I was all about the sciences, I loved math, so I didn't know anything about like, I, I was a big reader though, but I didn't know anything about like writers and what they do and all that. And so I, did, I just didn't know, I couldn't, I didn't have the terminology for what it was that I was doing. So this friend, who was more than a friend, <laughs> okay, he was, all yeah. right, <laughs> he was a he was a boyfriend, and I was so enamored by him at the time. And so he's and he was in theater. He was a theater director. He was like directing these awesome plays on campus. So he knew the arts really well. So he was able to look at what I was doing, and he's like, "You need to take a creative writing class." I did not even know what creative writing was at the time. But I only took it because he was, you know, I was, I was enamored. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. And so I took the class. And when I took the class, it gave me all the terminology that I needed 
to describe what it was that I was doing. If he hadn't told me about that, would I have discovered it? I think I would have, yeah. but in a roundabout way, like, it, I don't know. It, was, it really was fate. You know how, like, when your mind is open to something and you're, like, ready for it? Because I know when I started writing those stories, for me, I knew I'd found the thing. I knew I'd found the thing. I, it, it, just, it was so intoxicating to write those stories. It was something I wanted to do all the time. I loved it. I didn't care what anyone had to say about the stories. It was just, I knew I loved it. So that would have guided me. Like, I think that guided me where it, I needed to go. So I think that like even, so that question of what I have found it is not really a question to even ask. So, you know, talking about finding it, right? You, you could have written a any genre, and I mean, I hate the idea of genre, but you you found yourself straight in, in science fiction or speculative fiction. I also hate the word speculative. So you found yourself in science fiction, and I want to know why it was that exactly. I mean, you say so in the book, but mm -hmm. they don't know why you found yourself right in the middle of science fiction. Yeah, it was Nigeria. <laughs> it's always been Nigeria, and it's like, it's weird because I'm born and raised in the United States. You know, of course, both of my parents are Nigerian immigrants, and the, the, they have a very close, very close relationship to the country, and they've maintained that. And so they kind of instilled, that's really distracting. <laughs> it is really, I was just about to say, is like, there a party my head happening? My pulsing, that's how it feels. And I'm also hopped up on pain meds, so right. I was wondering if I was imagining <laughs> no, it a little bit. I, do, I don't want to lie. <laughs> I'm so it's glad you do. said something. <laughs> it's just like my head, it's just, oh, it's just moving everything. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, um, both of my parents were very are very connected to Nigeria. They've maintained that connection. They purposely did, and they instilled that in my siblings and me. And so I think that, like, that, the, it all came from it all came from that. It all, I don't know. It, it's a lot to explain, but like, um, like all of it just it's it's Nigeria. It's always been Nigeria. You know, um, I think you and I both came into uh, science fiction and and like superhero comics late in the game. There are people that have been doing it for a long time, mm -hmm. but there's this one thing you mentioned in the book, and I, I actually really loved it. You kind of really liked Garfield. At some point, you oh, come yeah. back from oh the God. hospital, and <laughs> you just want to find this comic strip in the newspaper. And I wanted to know, what is it about this lasagna-eating cat that yeah. you loved so much? I don't know. It's like there's certain things. It's like if people were to ask me what it is that I love about grasshoppers, I can't tell you. There's just something about them that makes me really happy. Like, I just love them. So it's, it's kind of like that, like Garfield, I just love Garfield. I, I just, I just I, I, let me try to get to the bottom of it. Um, I don't know, he's just this fat cat and he has attitude and he eats a lot and, and he's, sometimes he's really mean to Odie and, and, and John. And then also, but even above the actual, um, the story, it might have been also the, uh, the drawing style. I find the drawing stuff, and, and, and that's connected to when I started writing in the hospital, like there's something about like putting pen to paper and watching, watching the, the pen like write, like create. There's something about that, that the, the black line, and I, and I haven't really been able to get to the real bottom of it, but like there's something about that black line. And the Garfield comics have very dark lines as well, and so there's something that is very satisfying about them. They're, they're definite and, and they create story. Those lines create story and it just, it sounds very abstract, but I think that's, that's very connected to it because the way I, I would collect those comics and when I'd sit down and read them, it wasn't just that I was reading them. I remember, because there was one time where I was staring at a comic of Garfield for so long, just staring at it and like my, my mind was just, imprinting it, and to this day, I can draw Garfield. Like, after staring at it for that, I can draw Garfield anywhere. I'm going to insist that you ask Nettie when she signs your book oh, for yeah. her to draw Garfield. <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> so, you know, you're talking about what you love, um, Garfield, and one of the things that I think we both have in common is we're, we're writing in a space that didn't necessarily have people like us mm -hmm. in the space. When I think about when I started reading science fiction, it was very... Um, 
it wasn't intimidating. It was actually quite boring mm -hmm. uh, because th there was a lot of uh, uh, colonizing uh, fantasies yes. as well. Just people going into space and shooting the place up. Yes. And I mean, it, it even took me a while to get into a Star Trek for that very reason. Mm -hmm. I was just like, Federation for what? Just stay on your planet and deal with your own <laughs> issues. You know, so right. <laughs> when, when you we're ready to get into science fiction because you have this wonderful quote and I actually wrote it down word for word. It says, sometimes what you don't understand keeps you from seeing certain obstacles and in not seeing them, you unknowingly scale them. And I feel like when, when you're writing science fiction, you, I guess you hadn't been obsessed with it or been yeah. immersed in it. Yeah. So you broke the rules and you made so many rules. And do you think it's because you had that kind of distance from it? I think, well, it's, it's, it's complicated because, like, I read everything growing up. I didn't like science fiction either. Like, I, it was cold. Space was cold. The ships were cold. They were hard. They were inorganic. Um, and then it was also very white and very male. Like, that's just the, the fact of it. And I would pick up these books, and it's not that I had a problem with reading white male stories. I've read plenty of them. One of my favorite authors, Stephen King. Hello. But um, they, the worlds that these, these science fiction narratives were creating were, um, it felt like they, like, I don't need to see myself in a story. I don't need to see myself in a story. But I do want to feel like I could possibly exist in that world. And those worlds that they were writing, I did not. Like, I did not. Like, I couldn't even, like, there was no even, they didn't even know that someone like me could exist. And that was very off-putting. And at the time, I wasn't, I wasn't conscious of it. Like when I was a kid and I was just passing over or I'd try to read the science fiction story and just would put it down, I wasn't thinking these things on a literal level. This is me in hindsight looking at it. And what I naturally did as a kid would be like, I would, I would migrate to stories where the main character wasn't human or I would relate more to the aliens than the human beings. It was, it was very clear that it was just kind of naturally um, bumping against something for me. Science fiction became, uh, so, so I, didn't, I didn't come up you know, understanding the genre and, and consuming the genre and being influenced by it. That's why when people talk about influences, I'm like, you can't, that conversation does not apply to me. It I, does not. I relate to that. Yeah. yeah I mean, there, and, and, and I'm always talking about different bloodlines for science fiction as well. There are different lines. Not everything comes from the class, the golden age of science fiction, which is white and male. You can't, you can't tell me that every single narrative comes from those, those narratives. It doesn't. Um, there, there are different bloodlines. Like for me, I started writing science fiction because of, like I said, it keeps coming back to Nigeria. It keeps coming back. And like when I would go on these trips, and I would go like my um, my fa we'd spend half of our time here in Lagos, and then we would go to Emo State and go to my parents' villages, and and so like I started seeing technology show up in those places, and like it, it intrigued me, especially cell phones, and so like um, like first when I first started writing, I was writing a lot of fantastical, mystical stuff, and that was because of Nigerian. Um, like, you know, Nigerian mysticism that I'd learned about, you know, at growing up and that was forbidden and all of that, like, all of that. That's how I started writing that. So fantasy, same, same thing. I don't, I didn't come from, um, I was reading this type of fantasy and thinking, oh, I want to write this because I'm, you know, I'm responding to this over here. It's not a response. It was completely organic. That makes sense, actually. In fact, I always ask, why are Africans actually not the leaders in fantasy, sure. speculative uh, fiction, yeah, science exactly. fiction? Because exactly. it exists. Like, we have this, we'll call it an urban legend, about a woman who died on the road, okay, uh, violent death, and she basically stops male motorists who are driving at night stop and they give this woman a lift, right? And I mean, I'm sure this sort of story exists everywhere else, but the fact that, you know, she goes and then I guess they take her home, whatever, and then, they, you know, they either wind up dead or something. <laughs> and it was very much like cautioning men, like, stop picking up women at night. What's wrong with you? I mean, even now recently, there's a story about a, a taxi driving cat. Oh, really? <laughs> Tell me more about that. So apparently, there's a very successful taxi, right? Uh -huh. And when you get in, it looks like a man is driving the taxi. And then as you're going about, it's actually, you, you realize that it's a cat driving oh the taxi. God. And I think, 
I'm stealing that. <laughs> Taxi driving <laughs> cats. That. <laughs> and I feel like we we <laughs> innately have that fantasy. Yeah. It, it's something that lives with us. Yeah. And so it, it made a lot of sense that you know, you're, you're very good at what you do because we, we, as they say, we've been having it. Yes, yes, and, and, and I've been saying this for how long? I'm like, first of all, I can't understand why um, there isn't more, and, and, and I don't need things to be, I'm, I don't get obsessed with where things began. I don't get obsessed with that, but like African um, mysticism, it's just so ripe for fantasy. I don't know why there isn't, I don't know why it's only just kind of coming forward. And, and it's been in African literature, we know this. You know, you can read um, such mega classics as Things Fall Apart, and there's mysticism in there, yes, it's in there. But like, there's an amping up, you know, that fantasy yeah. does, it amps it up a lot. But like, it's all there, there's so many stories, there's so many things you can, not, I don't like using the word mine, but like, that, that it, it can be incorporated into the narrative. There's so much, I don't know why it's taken this long. I really don't, and it, it's so easy, and it's natural, and maybe that's why, because um, this, this idea of the mystical and the mundane coexisting is so natural that w I guess we don't notice it, and so it's, it's, just, it's just normal, and something has to be, I don't know, something has to seem a little bit abnormal to write about it and want to bring it forth. But I think it's also this idea that the things that we live around, the things that we know, um, aren't worthy yes. of, of telling, like yes. telling people, whenever I tell people, whatever little story you're telling me now, that's a story yes. that somebody would be interested in, and they go, ah, oh, well, not, mm -hmm. no, not really, that, that lack of confidence almost. Yeah, and I think that, like, that's one of the biggest things about me being Nigerian-American and writing what I'm writing. It's like, the, my stories were inspired, and I keep talking about the trips to Nigeria, and a lot of it has to do with, I'm coming from the United States, born and raised in the United States, I have a different eye. Those things that people see as normal here, to me being an outsider, in, but slash insider, it's not normal. Like I'm seeing, like uh, th there's certain things, like masquerades, for example, I love masquerades so much. I just love them, I'm obsessed with them. I, oh, I love them. And so, so me coming as a Nigerian American to Nigeria and then witnessing masquerades, like what that does to my mind, <laughs> and me being the kind of person who's just open to this stuff, I'm not afraid, I'm absolutely fascinated, and then obsessed, like utterly obsessed. It's not something that's normal to me. It is something that is, that is new and different, but it's also connected to who I am. You know, it's also connected to my family, like my dad was in one of those secret societies, you know, so that kind of thing. And so that's what kind of led to me writing what I'm writing, and that's what I think that that, like I was able to see and, and, and respect and then uphold, like hold up these, these narratives um, and these, these, these aspects, these aspects of culture because of my outsider insiderness. And I guess that also applies to having written, I'm going to hold it up again, Broken Places, Outer Spaces, get it? You may even get a Garfield when she signs it. <laughs> I can't promise you anything. But yeah, that's talking about being an, an outsider insider is also kind of how you felt in your body after the surgery, which led yeah. to the creation of some amazing series while you were there. And do you feel like, because you were an athlete, that's, that's who you are, you, you, you are fast, you, are, you know what you're doing, and then suddenly to wake up in the hospital and you're like, I don't know this body, but I'm in it. Yes. Did that feeling spark, I was gonna say spark joy. You see, I watched too much <laughs> Maria Kondo. Did it spark, uh, um, an idea of maybe this is what it feels like to be a cyborg almost yes. or oh, tell, yeah. because the women in your stories uh, often feel othered because of their, their powers or their bodies and they're really brilliant women. And after reading this, I, I came to understand the place that your characters are coming from. And so I wanted to know where is the moment that you went, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm using something that is deeply painful, something that makes me so angry, and I'm gonna turn it into something beautiful. Yeah, I think that, like, I don't know if there was a moment, it was, it's just like a gradual, it's an existence. Um, the cyborg thing, definitely. Uh, like, because even one of the things about walking, when I had to relearn how to walk, and like in, in, my, in my novel, Noor, I was taking a lot from that, the cyborg, like, like uh, what is it to be a cyborg? What is it to be disabled? And then 
melded with technology. Like, what is that? I have a metal rod lashed to my spine that's, that's keeping me straight, as straight as possible. So, I, I, you know, that's why I consider myself a rudimentary cyborg. Um, but like... Waiting for 2029. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we'll maybe we that. need to explain 2029. Um, you, I mean, you, you have the, the, the rod in your spine mm -hmm. and you're thinking about all the ways, all the imaginative ways that maybe you can become a cyborg in 2029, which is not very far away, right. uh, where you're basically super nimble, superhuman. You can turn your head all the way around like an owl. <laughs> so I'm also looking forward to 2029 because I, I want this to happen. <laughs> I totally want that to happen. I'm totally down for it. Like, but those ideas, um, like, I, 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 I embrace my experiences. I, you know, and that's the only way to be. You have to embrace your experiences. But back to the, the cyborg, um, when I learned how to walk, I literally had to learn, like, I don't walk the same way that I, that I learned how to walk when I was, uh, when I was a baby. It's, I had to literally learn how to walk in a different way. And so, like, for me now, every step is like, you, I have to do a bunch of calculations to lift leg, step forward, lean forward. Now the, the second leg, I, it's like every step that I take, it's like a robot. It's like a robot where I'm just conscious and doing all these calculations to get it done. And so that went right into this, this concept of what it is to be a cyborg. Um, and then also when it comes to just this being inside a body that is like, you're, once you're an athlete, you're always an athlete. It does, it's, it's, it's mental. It's, not, it's, it's physical, but it's mental. It's, it's probably more mental than physical. So what is it to be an athlete in the body where it, your body won't do what, it, like what you know it could do at one point, but it, like, it won't, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. The body like, is not listening. It, it, it's, it's, it's either, well, not listening or just unable. It's, it's like being almost... I don't want to say the wrong body because that's not it. It's mine, but it's it's a it's definitely a kind of experience of being two things, and and those definitely go into my into my characters. Like that, those, but all of my experiences do. Even my experiences as an athlete go into my characters. Like on the tennis court, for example, um, there were times where uh, there there two things, two things. Like um, there were times where I I knew I could see through time. Like I knew where the ball was going to be before it got there. I, it was like about a second or two before um, where I knew where it was going to be. And so like I know what that feels like. That's the superpower. So if I'm writing about superheroes or if I'm writing about a character who has these abilities, I know what that feels like. You know. And then there, and even in um, in my novel Binti or my novella series Binti, this idea of treeing. That's a tennis term. It's a tennis term. When you're treeing, it's when you're playing out of your mind. It's when you're just like, everything is, everything is perfectly aligned. You can do no wrong. It could last one minute. It could last a whole, for the whole match. It could last a half hour. But it's like you just, your subconscious, everything is perfectly aligned. And that's what treeing is. And so I took that term and then applied it to mathematics. And, and then also mixed it with nature, and that's how I came up with that for Binti. So I understand what I, under, when she trees, I know exactly what that is. So basically, like all of my, all of my experiences, whether they're positive or negative, I use them. Um, I, I kind of, um, yeah, I use them in my, I, I bring them to my characters and kind of let it grow from there. There's another theme in Broken Places, Outer Spaces, which is um, stubborn bravery. And I, at, at least that, that's definitely what kept on coming through for me. You have this uh, stubborn bravery. In fact, you, you have an incident where you, d you don't want to drive at night oh. anymore, and then you get a work assignment. And I, I want you to share that story with me because I don't know how to tell you this, but once I read this book, I was like, oh my gosh. I see so much of you in some of your mm. characters that that stubborn bravery definitely comes through in most of your protagonists. So I'd just like you to share that story with these good folk who are going to buy the book, all of you. I'm counting <laughs> how many of you there are. There are going to be so many books sold today. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So once I got through all of that and I was walking again, and that's a whole process in itself, um, one of the things that I lost is like my proprioception 
uh, proprioception is like the, where, where you know what, where you are in space, where your body is in space. So with my legs, my legs lack proprioception, which means that if I'm in the dark, I don't, sometimes I don't know where they are. So that makes driving at night difficult. Like, and this is something that people take for granted. You know, you jump in the car and you can move your feet and you, you just, you don't even think about it. You know, but for me, I get in the car, and, and I remember I, when I learned this, the first time I tried driving at night, when I didn't understand what my condition was, I tried driving at night, and um, my legs just disappeared. It was night, and I just didn't even know where my legs were, and it was terrifying. And I remember, like, I couldn't put my foot on the brake, because I couldn't find where my foot was. It was terrifying, and I remember... I happened to be driving at night and I rolled into the middle of the street and then I was able to finally find the break and I'm like, I can't drive at night. I'm never driving at night again. And so then at the time I was um, interning at a newspaper and um, I got this assignment that I really wanted to do and I had to interview this family and it was like a half hour away and it was at night and I was like, and I couldn't, you know, there was no one who could drive me. I had to drive myself. And so in that, and I was like, I want to go. I want to go. I'm not going to not do this because of this stupid condition. And so I figured it out. I was like, well, why don't I just drive with the flashlight? So, like, if I, if I had the flashlight, I could just flash it on my feet, and on my legs, and know, okay, the, the, that's where they are. That's where they are. All right. And then keep going. And so I, learned, I did that. And I, met, I got to the place, and that was where I discovered how, how to drive with uh, um, using, using a flashlight. And to this day, that's how I drive at night. And when I drive people, I kind of have to tell them, like, okay, this is going to seem weird. <laughs> don't be scared. Don't be scared. <laughs> yeah, don't be scared. But this is what I have to do. So, so yeah, it was, it was like um, I found a solution. There was, there's always a way. Like in that, the lesson that I learned in that was that there's always a way and you can, be crea you can create it out of thin air. There, I have never seen of anybody who does that. I don't know any, I, I, at the time there was no internet, like the internet wasn't the, what it is now, so I couldn't just go and Google and see what, it, what happens with people who do this. I don't even know if I did now, if I'd find anything. I just kind of figured it out. I think you're absolutely right when you say there's always a solution, which is kind of, you know, what I, I, I got from this, that no matter how difficult a thing is, you can still propel yourself forward and have something beautiful come from it. Yeah. And I wondered, because I, I know at the back you say you started writing this a while ago, like mm -hmm. the, I think the first four pages or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know what prompted you to tell the story now? Yeah, the, I started writing it, um, I started writing it like, maybe six months after all of this happened. And I wanted to write it, the reason why I started writing it, and I didn't know how to do any of that, I just was writing, and the reason why I did that was because I wanted to catch what I was feeling at the time. I wanted to preserve that, because you know how memory always changes things in, in, in hindsight. So I wanted to capture that, because I don't know, I, and I don't know why, I, I think I've always been one who records. Always been one, like, I'm, even before I was writing, I was always the one who was taking pictures, who was seeing moments and wanted to record it. So I was always like that, and I knew that that time was something that I wanted to, that I wanted to record. And, um, and so th there we were years later. I'd done this TED Talk, and um, TED had asked me about writing these. Th they did these short books, and they had asked me to, to write something. And that was the first thing that popped into my mind. I'm like, oh, I want to, I want to write this. I want to do this. And um, I had originally written a whole big manuscript, like a really long manuscript. And but I'm like, okay, let me write something that just focuses very specifically on that exact, that exact time period. And and one of the reasons why I also wanted to write it, and I like the idea of it being short, was that I would, you know, I would have these events. I would, you know, do all these things and. And I was tired of explaining to people what it was. Because it's so complicated. Like, how am I supposed to tell people, OK, my balance is bad because I can't, you know, my pro proprioception is this and that. I, it was just too much to explain. So if I wrote this thing, then more people would know my story, and I wouldn't have to keep explaining myself. It is, honestly. It's beautiful, and it, it, it's like um, 
a homecoming. And it's so lovely to read your homecoming where you came home to yourself and you also came home to the stories. Now, there was a very a rude, please start Q&A here that happened oh, out yeah. of the corner <laughs> of my eye. It was flashing. So I am going to give you all an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, please put your hands up. Uh, so there's a hand over here. Somebody's got a roving mic. They will come to you soon. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michena Ebedefe, and anyone who follows me knows I'm a very big fan of, of Enedi and all that she does. I would like to ask, I have a few questions I would like to ask, but I want to share... Not too many. We've got 18 minutes okay, left. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I will try to limit it, but I would like to share um, my Enedi story. Everybody who is a member of my book club knows my Enedi story, but I want everyone to know my Enedi story. Okay, so... Um, a couple of years ago, uh, as a boy, I, I loved fantasy. I, I read all of the Percy Jackson books, the Harry Potter books, all of the books that has explored fantasy, sci-fi, I loved them. And uh, it, it built this perception for African books because I didn't really read, I didn't really see all of that in African books. And I was like, no, I don't read African books and all. Then a friend of mine named Chooks uh, recommended uh, Inido Karafo to me and uh, got me a couple of her books. And then I read Lagoon, and that was in 2018. I read Lagoon, and I have read Nady ever since, <laughs> back to back. I don't think there's any book of yours I haven't read. So uh, I'm a very big fan, and Lagoon, what Lagoon did to me was made me realize how, uh, it made, I, I saw myself, these characters had names like mine, and I was able to see that African expression in a book that is supposed to be sci-fi. So in my head, sci-fi was just uh, Western books. So let me just share that a bit. So um, yeah, on, online you, uh, I'd like to, I want to ask you about how this thing you do, African futurism, mm -hmm. how you've, you have many times talked about how you would like to be referred to as writing African futurism. And then it seems like irrespective of the number of times you've said this, a number of persons have decided that no, you write Afrofuturism. And then you've said this over and over again. You have a blog article yes. that, that you, I don't know how you've managed to pin it. Whenever you, anybody Googles in it or careful, before your Wikipedia, it pops up. And yet somehow, uh, they still, still try to. I don't know how that, I know you've expressed how angry it makes you feel, but does it make you feel like uh, um, people are not listening to you? That's my first question. Then secondly, um, um, the pressure. I want, to, I want to know if there's some kind of pressure. Like, for my undergraduate thesis, I wanted to write on African futurism, even though the topic was not approved. <laughs> yeah, and then, um, does it make you feel pressured that you are some kind of the source for African futurism, that you feel like, okay, whatever I have to put out now forms a perception of what African futurism should look like. So do you feel pressured when writing that, okay, this is the perception people would have of books that are African and sci-fi. Does it give you, do you feel some kind of pressure and then um, lastly, so I'm very sorry. And then lastly, you, you have this quote that, you, uh, that has stayed with me since you made it, I think a couple of years ago, where you said, uh, I didn't just beat the deadline, I obliterated it. So uh, how, do you, how do you keep up with your, with your industry? Because you are so industrious, you, you have almost a body of work coming out every year, every month. It's hard to keep up. And then, so how do you do it? Is it like you have manuscripts already waiting to be published or you are constantly producing. Okay. So that's it. Thank you so much. Okay, cool. Sorry, just before you answer, does anyone else have, oh, oh can you just pass the mic to over there first and then we'll, oh, okay, we'll start there and then I see you over there. Yo, and then I see you over there too. Okay, that's a lot. Um, I'm trying to remember all of it. <laughs> um, the first one was uh, about African futurism and yes, once again, I have written a blog post on what it is that defines African futurism. It addresses why it's like how it's different from Afrofuturism. So there's that, um, and, and it talks about why I don't um, I, I don't call myself an Afrofuturist. I'm an African futurist. One word. Uh, and you you asked about. I'm always having to explain this to people, and um, do I feel that people are not listening to me? It definitely feels like that sometimes. It definitely feels like uh, I'm, I'm constantly repeating myself. I am constantly explaining. 
I am, and, and then also I feel like a lot of the questions that are asked of me on this subject are just questions that are trying to trip me up so you can start a thing, and it's annoying. Uh, and and I, I think that uh, there is a conversation to be had about Afrofuturism and African futurism. I don't like them being pitted as versus one versus the other because they're not the same definition. They're not doing the same things, and they both do exist. And that's fine for both of them to exist. I think there's, there are probably more things that exist. Um, but I, but like my, main, my main reason for talking about these things is that I think there needs to be a conversation about um, black stories and about where, about that, the fact that different um, peoples, different black peoples of the world have different narratives and we're not all the same. That needs to be said multiple times, we're not all the same, and that's okay. There is nothing wrong with not all being the same, and, and me saying that we're not all the same, there's nothing divisive about what I'm saying. It's just a fact, and it's good. You know, so I, I think that that conversation is, is really important, and I think that um, there's a lot I can say on this topic because uh, there are, I see the results of they're not, being this discussion, I see the results. I've seen them on multiple levels. I've seen them on the Hollywood level. Um, it's a problem. I will just say that it's a problem. And I hope that at some point there's like an actual discussion, an open discussion where people just don't fall into being offended because that's what often happens. People fall into being offended and they just think that you're, you're putting them down when it's not even about them in the first place. So I'll stop there. Um, the next one is, do I feel pressure to, um, about like, be, that I'm, I'm writing, if I'm writing something that is African futurist, do I feel pressure about um, that de kind of defining the, the term? I don't really care about that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I think he was asking if you feel pressure because you're, you're so prolific. Yeah, or to feel pressure to, to write produce, it, yeah. to produce it. No, I don't care about that either. I write, like I, I, I can only, I literally can only write what I will write, like what comes. I don't have control, I can't like be like, okay, this needs to, I need to fill in this gap over here. I can't do that. I, I, I can just look at the gap and be like, wow, I hope that gap gets filled, <laughs> filled in. But I, I can't, you know, I can't do that. And then when it comes to uh, deadlines, um, crushing deadlines and, and the way that I um, create, I don't know, as, I, as I've said, the way that I started writing was the way that I started writing. It's something that I do. It's something that I enjoy. It's something that feels like, it's something that comes from within. So it's not something that I'm like trying to, I'm not trying to produce a book every, every year. That's, I don't care about that either. <laughs> um, it's just, it's something that I love doing and so I do it. And do I have stuff that's in the pipeline? I mean, I've been writing for so long. I've written a lot of novels and yeah, it just, um, I just do it. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I just do it. So you, uh, you my sister in the yellow top. Oh, did the mic move already? I'm sorry. And then there, there's like, yeah, two people over there afterwards. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I, Nandy, big, big fan. Thank you for sharing how you started writing. It means a lot to me. My first full-length full novel was about like African mutism and all of that. And hearing that you started from similar places means a lot to me. So I just wanted to ask you, how were you able to handle like perception, criticism towards you? when you began writing the particular genres that you wrote, were there like doors shot at you and how did you like come through? Yeah, um, well, I, I think that I've, the criticism part, I, I think it has to do with the way that I came up. I started writing in, I started officially writing in the university in a creative writing class. And so like you have these workshops and you hear what people think and all of that. And so like, and I have, two master's degrees, I have a master's degree in literature, a master's degree in journalism, and then a PhD in literature. And so throughout all of that, I was taking creative writing courses. Um, my, my PhD has an emphasis in creative writing, which meant that my dissertation was a novel. So throughout all those years of, of um, school, I'm writing, 
but every, like all of my professors were anti-science fiction, anti-fantasy. Like they would put it on the syllabus, you are not to write this type of, um, these types of stories in this class. So I'm, you know, I'm already coming up against criticism to begin with, by definition. And like, like I said, I can't not write what I write. I write what comes. So I'm writing, like, I'm, I'm, for example, I was in a novel writing class for my PhD. She, the professor puts on the syllabus, no one is to, to write fantasy or science fiction. I literally had written The Shadow Speaker. You know, that was what I was working on, which is this narrative that's set in the near future. It's set in the country of Niger after an apocalypse has happened and mysticism has come back to the world and you've got all these people with these weird abilities. That's what I was working on. And the professor puts, you, no one can write this type of literature in this novel writing workshop. And all I did was, um, I knew I was gonna workshop what I was gonna workshop, I knew it. All I did was just change the label. I just said, oh yeah, what I'm writing is magical realism. <laughs> and it was fine. And, and so like, I, I've always known that criticism. And, 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 um, and, I, and I understood that the professors who were anti-fantasy and anti-science fiction, anti-any speculative fiction, they were coming from a place, and I understood this early, that they were coming from a place of not understanding those types of stories. They didn't know those types of stories. They, they knew the classics, and that's what they were familiar with, and that's what they knew, and often when people don't know something, they demonize the thing that they don't know, because it makes them feel, um, it makes them feel a little bit powerless, like they don't know as much. So I understood that. So I knew how to navigate those things. And, and also a lot of it had to do with, um, I was always very secure in my stories. Like no one needed to tell me my stories were good. I knew my stories were good. I didn't need, like, I didn't need anyone outside of me to tell me that. So I had that. So when I had certain criticisms, I, I could hear the, crit like if there's something that I need to learn, my, I, my ear was open to understanding it and letting it go, come through but I also knew how to discern the things that were a problem. Those criticisms that were not really criticisms, criticisms, they were coming from somewhere else. I knew how to discern those things almost instinctively. And I think it always comes back to how I started writing. So um, yeah, I, I'm like, I'm very open to listening to criticisms, but I can, like, I'm secure enough for, that, for those things not to kind of deter the soul of what I'm doing. And that's the kind of confidence you need to go into a space where people like you just are not yes. represented at, and don't exist for all intents and purposes. Um, hi, Nedi. Such a pleasure to be here. My name is Chidima Okechuku. Nice to meet you all. Um, so my question is, scoliosis is a disability that not a lot of people in Africa know about, mm -hmm. but a lot, some people in Africa are actually suffering from it, right? and you are someone that was in a line, like you were an athlete and you had to literally change course because of that surgery. So what, you know, word of advice do you have for maybe, will I say people that are privileged or knowledgeable to know that they have scoliosis, right, in Africa? Like what would you tell them to be able to get off that space if they're, you know, maybe gone through surgery or mm -hmm. about to go through surgery or are scared to go through, you know, the necessary process. Yeah, that's that's an interesting question that I've never had before. But am I, I think we're, to we're gonna take one more. That where I where's the it now? <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, there's the person. Okay, just one person. Nidhi, you can answer okay. now. Please get that mic to that person, and then we're gonna be done. Okay. Okay. Um, first, everyone should be screened for scoliosis. So there's that. And, and second, um, most scoliosis is not super severe like mine. I want to repeat that again. So if anyone has been, you know, has been told they have it, this is m more than likely not going to happen to you. It's rare that it gets so severe that you, that you go through what I go through. So like, um, yeah, people are screened for it. You, you address it. There are exercises that you can do. There's also, sometimes you wear a back brace, stuff like that. So, so there's that aspect. It, if someone, um, and I, I have met th so far now f three or four other people who have had the same thing happen to me, that happened to them. Two of them never walked again. Um, so it's a thing. So if you're having, if you're, you're supposed to have like, a, it's the spinal fusion. If you're supposed to have that, make sure you get all the information and make sure you have the best, the best doctor. If something like this happens to you, 
um, or, or anything, anything like anything severe like this. It's just that's uh, life shattering. I don't know. I, I guess the advice that I would give is to face it. You face it and, and figure out ways to um, figure out ways to deal with it. Figure out ways to um, and, the, and oftentimes the ways that you have to figure out have to be creative. Be creative. Um, and, and also there's technology these days that's, that's, that's insane. So, um, but yeah, those are the main things that I could say about that. Our last question person, we literally have three minutes. No, we don't have three minutes. This clock is wrong. I'm so sorry. Yeah. You, no. Oh, there was someone in the back who had a question. You don't have a question anymore. Oh, okay. That does not mean, okay. Does, is there someone else who has a very quick question? Otherwise, we're, we're going to wrap it up in our last two minutes. Oh, oh, yes, over there. Sorry, the mic is coming to you. Thank you so much for the session. Um, Isaiah Adekbodi from Marshall State. <coughs> okay, this is my question. Okay. In writing outside of your space, how do you write without enough materials for the, for the sake of very similitude? Wait, say, say okay. that again. We sorry, can here. you bring when, the mic closer you, to your okay, face? Okay, sorry. When you write out of your own space, mm -hmm. for example, you're writing about a culture you're not familiar with, how do you cope with such writing without enough materials for the sake of very similitude? Um, I'm trying to interpret your question. So when, when I write outside of, uh, outside of what I know, is that what you're saying? Outside of what I know, how do I um, fill in the blanks, kind of? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, that's where the creativity comes from. Uh, well, there's, there's, uh, there's research. Okay, so if I'm, like, for example, if I'm writing about a culture that I don't know, like, and this is advice that I always give, I try to get as close to it as possible. I try to get as, however, however that may be. So if I'm writing about a culture, um, a culture that I do, that that's not mine, for example, um, I try to get close. So I try to, like I was writing about uh, in, in Who Fears Death, uh, female genital mutilation. I have not had that done to myself, but I'm writing about it. Um, I I interviewed three women who had it done. And, and, like, and that's where the journalistic aspect for me, like I said, I have a master's in journalism. I've been a journalist before. I know how to ask questions. Um, and I know how to like ask the difficult questions. And, that's, and I use that. So I, I, interviewed, I interviewed them deeply. I interviewed them deeply. And then on top of that, I read. I did, you know, I did, my, I did my research. And then um, and there was a, also a, there was one documentary that I watched that I watched because I was like, okay, I've, heard, I've listened to these women's stories. I've, I've, I know about the areas where it happens in the culture and I go deep into the culture. Also, there's a part of myself that has to get step, that has to step back because, you know, of course, a part of myself is gonna be like, or a big part of myself is gonna be like, this is wrong, this is terrible, all this stuff. Um, so I, I, yeah, I've got 30 seconds, 24, 23. Uh, yeah, so I go in and, and, and do that kind of research, but I also felt I had to watch a video of it happening, and it was painful and difficult. I know, I did that. I felt if I, if I was gonna write about it, I have to get as close as possible, and some of that stuff hurts. Some of that stuff is very disturbing, and I, I had nightmares, it was bad, but that's how I, that's how I do it. So, wow, we, our time, uh, you, you finished just on time. You see, an athlete always knows. So I would like to thank you all. And Nnedi, I would like to thank you. And again, um, the books are on sale downstairs. But thank you for sharing so much of yourself and how you came to your writing. That was really beautiful. Thank you.